7, we lose the perspective of what God's holy book tells us about how to resolve conflict. All right? And so the Word of God is where we start. Uh, I was amazed at a survey done that uh, it said like 7 out of 10 Christians will not biblically resolve a conflict. They will just ignore it because of their pride. And, and we handle it. And, and, we went, and last week we went back and we talked about how our childhood and how our parents and I looked at the opportunity that I had as I raised three great daughters, and hopefully I can correct some of the mistakes I've made and, and conflict, and how me and Carrie have uh, resolved our conflicts over the past. And so this uh, this peacemaker thing is going to walk through the four principles that you're going to see. Uh, today we're going to cover two, and then we'll cover one each week uh, for the next two weeks, and then we'll close it out. Uh, the other book, the other book that we're going to use is called The Peacemaker. Remember, Jesus actually, on the Sermon on the Mount, called the Beatitudes, right? One of them is called, one of them is blessed are those that are peacemakers, right? Not peacekeepers, but makers. And when you study that uh, Beatitude, uh, there's a lot of stuff in this, and biblical stuff. Great book. I encourage you to buy it and read it. It will change your perspective on how you handle conflict at your job, how you handle conflict with your marriage, how you handle conflict with your kids and your relationships. And again, I encourage you to buy this and, and read this. And so uh, those are the things that we're going to be looking at. Uh, we're going to be pulling stuff away. Uh, and just, uh, like I said, we're going to look at a lot of scripture. And just, I hope that uh, as we go through today, as we go through the next little weeks, you're going to look at scripture, and you're, you're probably going to see a lot of these scriptures and be like, I know that. Yeah, I know you know that. But the key, the key is not knowing it. The key is actually putting that scripture into action. All right? And so we're just going to do a lot of reviewing of that and talking. I got some questions for you. Uh, like I said... When we get to the questions, I want interaction. So when I ask a question, I don't want them to be silent. All right? When I ask a question upstairs, I don't want you to talk back at me up there. All right? But down here, you can't talk back at me. All right? So, all right? so anyway, uh, let's go ahead and go with a word of prayer, and then we will jump into what we're going to talk about this morning. God, we just come to you right now in prayer. Lord, for a lot of us in this room, it's been a crazy week, crazy weekend. I'm busy. Um, maybe some of us stepped in here and we're tired and we're wore out, but we want to know how to glorify you. And God, that's my prayer. That's my prayer for all of us in this room. That whether it's conflict or whatever it might be, that we honor you, we glorify you, that we begin to walk our lives as disciples of Jesus. With, the, with, this, with this mindset of how do I bring glory to you in this situation, in this moment? How do we do that? Because I believe, God, when we start to, to look at our lives as an opportunity to glorify you in every little moment, not just in big moments, but even in the mundane moments, everything begins to change for us. And the kingdom moves forward. And it's not about us. It's about you. And so, God, we give you glory right now uh, in this moment. And, uh, Lord, we ask that the scripture will come alive and that the Holy Spirit will breathe into us. All right? What you want to teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I got, to, I got a worksheet for you. Some fill in the blanks if you want to follow along and put with your notes. Ron, you pass these out, so I won't be calling you again. I'll oh, send Debbie, you hand out some over here. Danny, you want to hand out some over here? So you have a, you don't have to have one, but if you don't mind, it will keep you up to date on where we're going and what we're doing. All right, so we talked about, we're going to talk about, we're building a trail map. Uh, this whole concept of conflict resolution is like, uh, a trail. We're following a trail. We got four points that we want to make it to on our trail. Today we want to make it to two of them, all right? And so we got to understand the, the landscape of conflict and what, it, what God is actually calling us to do when we step into conflict. Because usually when we step into conflict, uh, I don't know about you guys, 
But I grew up, my, my mom was a baker, um, and they were known in the countryside of, of Kansas as being quick tempered. Uh, they were bakers. And we're actually going to talk about my grandma uh, today upstairs, but uh, she, was, she was a little bit different. She was. She looked like Mrs. Butterball, so she wasn't black. Uh, but she was, she was, she was a great cook, great woman, uh, Methodist. But she loved God, and she was so good with uh, our family, with kids, with grandkids. But uh, the rest of us, my grandpa, and the rest of us, man, we were quick to to be angry. And when we get into a conflict, we've been jumped right off the bat and trying to defend who we are and what we want, right? Because that is the nature of conflict. I've got to win. <laughs> what I want you to do is I want you to throw that mindset out. Because it's not about you winning and conflict. It's about glorifying God. All right? So the first thing that we want you to see is that when we get into conflict, is that we have conflict as our constant opportunity. All right? Conflict is our constant opportunity. Opportunity to what? For what? All right. What does that mean? What is the? What is conflict? Why, why are we talking about this? Why is it a constant opportunity? It's a constant opportunity to glorify God. We'll talk about that just in a second. Conflict is not necessarily bad or destructive. We get this mindset that conflict is bad, and it's not. Conflict is healthy. It's good. You guess what? God created us all different, right? We have different personalities, different wants, different likes. Different opinions, right? We have all these things that are different, all right? And so naturally, guess what's going to happen? We're going to have conflict. We're going to have conflict because we are different. And it's not bad. Even when conflict is caused by sin and causes a great deal of stress, God can and God does use it for good. Did you know that? God does and he uses a conflict that is created by sin for his glory, for his goodness, if we're not stuck on ourselves. Paul uses this, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 28. Uh, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for the good. And we usually use that about things that are tragic, don't we? We, we pull that out when bad things happen. But that's not necessarily what Paul's talking about. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those who whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So Paul is talking about that even in conflict, a lot of churches are guilty of this, especially in leadership, that when the conflict arises, we like to push it back. We don't want to handle the conflict. And we as Christians don't want to handle the conflict. We would rather ignore it. We would rather run from it. But Paul is telling us, hey, guess what? God can take even a conflict and he can use it for his glory. He can use it for his good. As long as we as Christians are thinking, you know what? This is an opportunity. An opportunity for what? It's an opportunity to glorify God. Not myself. Because we talked about last week. Remember what we said? If you're here to figure out how to win in conflict... Or, or for you to, to hear your voice, you know, to prove that you're how to win an argument, then you need to you need to go to another class because that's not what we're going to give you. All right, we're giving you how to biblically resolve. All right, the Apostle Paul wrote in First Corinthians chapter ten, verse thirty-one. You know, and do all things, and we'll look at it here in a minute. We'll pull it up, but to do all things, do it to the glory of God. Conflict actually provides three significant opportunities by God's grace that you can use in your conflict, all right? So there's three things that we can do. Here's the first thing. All right, we can glorify God by trusting, obeying, what's that awesome? Imitating him. You can see it. I'm looking from the side, all right? So we have, three, we have three things here. The first thing is that we can glorify God by trusting, obeying, and imitating Him in conflict. You know, if you ever stop, like I, like this summer, we went in May to Watermark Church. They talked about conflict. They had a class. It was really good. Um, and it got me thinking about the biblical concept of conflict and how we as leadership really, pardon me, we suck at it. Let's just, let's just call it as... And I have—I don't think I have any elders in here. You know, 
They're all. Do we have one? Oh, we have one right here. All right. But he's new. All right. He's only he's not even a full year. All right. So we'll, we'll give Keith a pass on it. All right. Okay. But let me just tell you. All right. I've been in church leadership for 30 years. I uh, came here in 2000, uh, 2000, 2000 uh, so I've been a part of this church for a long time. We suck at conflict, all right? I would, and I would say that to any of the elders that would be present here today. We, do, we don't do a very job with it. And I got to looking at this, and I was watching this. Uh, we were down at, in Dallas at this conference, and they were, they were talking to church leaders about, and I was just like, oh, my gosh. This is not what we do. How embarrassing is this? So I started praying about it, and then I, I bought the book that they recommended, read this book, started looking at scripture, and I was like, we have got to talk about this as a church, as a body of believers. I mean, I love Jesus, and I want, to, I want to shine Jesus in everything that I do, but I never thought about it, shining Jesus in a conflict. Instead, my, my, my thing was, I always have to win in conflict. Anyway, so my point is that when I started looking at this and studying this this summer, you guys know that we have foster kids, and I, I hate it. I love to be honest with you. Right. I hate being a foster parent. It's really hard. My wife is really good at it, and she's wonderful with the kids. I'm more, I was a youth minister. I like older kids. We have, we've had younger kids. We've had boys. And I always thought I wanted a boy. And now I'm like, man, I'm so glad I had any daughters. All right. And I, I spent my time in the two years that we've been fostering trying to talk my wife out of it. And just a couple of months ago, right before the boys left, I actually have broken, I broke her down. And she was like, we're done. We're done. When these boys leave, I, you know, I don't want to do this. We're, we, we're a constant conflict, you and I, because of the stress of this. And God was like, you idiot. To me. Not to my wife. To me. And so we, we've taken a break. The boys, the, you know, there was a lot of conflict in the way that I handled it. And I started looking at it. And I started, as I, as I was reading this stuff, and I started applying it to my marriage. My wife, actually, she's not in here. She's in the nursery today. She didn't, you know, she came last week, so I just want you to know she was like, I'm not going to that anymore. Right? <laughs> she would have been here, all right? But uh, she actually told me, she goes, you're handling conflict. Because we had a couple more weeks with the boys. She goes, you're actually handling it differently after reading and studying this stuff. Because I'm looking at it, I want to glorify God. And so I told my wife, I said, hey, we're not done with Foster. We're going to take a break after Christmas. We're going to call. And I'm going to pray that they give us easy kids. But you know, <laughs> we're going to say, hey, our house is back open. Because I don't want to end it the way we were going to end it. I want to glorify God. And so that's the first thing that we, we, we look at this when we have conflict. When it's a constant, constant opportunity, we can glorify God by trusting, obeying, and imitating Him. Here's the second thing uh, that we can do. We can serve other people by helping to bear their burdens or by confronting them in love. All right? Not confronting them because you want to win, but you're confronting them in love. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, which is what? Love one another. To love one another, right? And so we confront them in love. We serve other people by bearing their burdens and by confronting them in love. And, and I, I do not do that very well at times, especially when my, my quick temper gets away from me. And I don't confront them in love. And so it's always important to step out of a confrontation and go, okay, how do I glorify God? And when you ask that simple question, everything changes. Because all of a sudden you realize, if I'm going to glorify God, it doesn't mean that I have to win. Because God is so big that even if I don't win, He can still be glorified. Amen. All right? But a lot of us as Christians don't want to ask that question because we want to win in our argument. Here's the third thing. All right, to grow to be like Christ by confessing sin and turning from attitudes that promote conflict. All right? Those are the three things. When Paul talks about this in Romans, he talks about this in 1 Corinthians and 10. He's talking about these things. These concepts are totally overlooked in most conflicts because people naturally focus on escaping the situation. Right? Maybe a lot of us, we don't want to win, but conflict really... Uh, gives us anxiety, and so when we're in the middle of a conflict, we're just like, I'm out. I'm just going to go. I'm going to go to the other room. I'm not going to talk about it for two weeks. 
and then your marriage is grinding on each other and you can't figure out because you're hey, I'm just going to avoid it. And then eventually you come back and, and you repeat this cycle, right? Or maybe maybe it's at work or you know, just avoid it. Hey, there's a conflict. I'm not going to resolve it. Or maybe at church you just decide, you know what? You know, it's a big auditorium. I'll sit on one side and the person I'm having a conflict can sit on the other side. And I'll just avoid them. I'll go out this door. We got a lot of doors, don't we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll just go out this door, they'll go out that door, I'll just avoid it. No big deal. Well, it is a big deal to God. It is a big deal because your spirit is disturbed from this situation. Therefore, it's wise to periodically step back from conflict and ask yourself whether you're doing all that you can to take advantage of these three things, right? Are you taking advantage of all three of these things? Because God wants to teach you something in conflict. And we miss this. That's what Paul says in Romans chapter 8. And so here's the first thing that he wants to teach us, all right? Like we've said this already, he wants to glorify, and he wants you to glorify him. So that's the first thing you ask yourself. In the middle of a conflict, how do I glorify God? In the middle of a teenage crisis, you know, some of you have teenagers, all right? And I, I get you, man. I've, just, I've spent a lot of time with teenagers. I raised three daughters. We have drama. And there's times that I wanted to just slap them. All right? So in the conflict here, let me just beat it out of them. That ain't going to work. All right? Instead, you step back and you go, how do I glorify God? And they start to see Christ in you. Right? And it changes how your conflicts are managed within your household. When the Apostle Paul urges the, uh, the, the church in Corinthians to live to the glory of God, he was not talking about just one hour on a Sunday morning. He's talking about your everyday life, every moment. He says there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, whatever you do, whether you eat or you drink, do it to the glory of God. Man, that encompasses a lot of things. How, how were some of you guys yesterday during the OU football game? Did you glorify God? <laughs> <laughs> I did better than others. You did better than others? <laughs> yeah, right to the end? Yeah. Yeah, see, I mean, everything that we do, everything that we do, whether we eat or drink, whether we cheer, root, or whatever team, whatever it might be, you do it to the glory of God. That's the mindset that I think that we as a church have failed to teach or disciple people to, have, to understand. Everything that you do, you do to the glory of God. Of God. He's not talking just about on Sundays. He's talking about your everyday life. When you go to work. When you come home. He wanted them to show God the honor and bring him praise to their daily life, especially by the way that they resolve conflicts. And so here's this verse that we've been talking about. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, it all to the glory of God. And I think we, we skim through that. We go, yeah. <laughs> That's the Apostle Paul, right? He's probably teaching that to the church in Corinth to, to an elevated class of believers, right? I mean, that's how we justify it. Like, that probably had to be like uh, for really spiritually mature Christians and not for me. No. Paul's talking about for all of us. And listen to the rest. Uh, I guess I don't have it on me. Uh, let me read it to you, all right? The rest of this, verse uh, 32. Give no offense to the Jews or the Greeks or to the church of God. After he says, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God, he says, do not give offense to anybody. Greeks, Jews, and to the church of God. Verse 33. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, Paul says. Man, isn't that what we do in conflict? Like, oh, I'm going to use this to get my advantage, to get my way. And you, you could use this in any conflict, whether it's at the church or at home or at your workplace. I'm trying to do my advantage. And Paul's like, no, 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 no. But that many may be saved. Be imitators as me as I imitate Christ. And I know you've heard that. That's in first, first uh, uh, Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. But listen, when Paul says that, he's dripping in humility. All right? 
Because stop when you think about it. You don't want to say be imitators of me if you're not dripping in humility in humility of Christ. Right? And so Paul's looking at this going, whatever we do, we do it to the glory of God. As I mentioned before, uh, you can glorify God in the midst of conflict by trusting and obeying him and, and imitating him. So Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to look at some Proverbs here. Uh, verse uh, 4 and 6. Someone want to read that out loud? Success in the sight of God and men. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. Yeah. Is that what you're wanting? Yep. Is that what I wanted? I was getting a drink. Yes. All right, so Proverbs 3 4 says that. Uh, John 14 15. Um, <clears throat> what's this one say? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yeah, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right? And that's one of the things that Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. Right? And we look at this and we're like, wow, do we have to keep all of them? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want you to keep all of them. Ephesians 5 1 says, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. Alright? Be imitators of God. Think about that. When you step into a conflict, Paul is telling you to be imitators of God. Hmm. I've been in a lot of church conflict before, and I don't see this very often in the middle of the church conflict. I don't see the two sides going. You imagine the two sides that are in conflict trying to imitate God. Man, the conflict is not to be resolved, isn't it? It's impossible not to. All right? One of the best ways to keep these concerns uh, upmost in your mind is regularly asking yourself and focusing on this question. How can I please and honor the Lord in this situation? So here's the first roadmap on our trail of conflict as we walk down this trail. The first one, the first sign point that we get to is glorifying God. All right. So here's the second part. This is the harder one. All right. This one is... This thing is great. There it is. Get the log out of your own eye. All right, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail here. All right, we're going to roll through it. All right, the most challenging part of peacemaking, all right, is set uh, for in Matthew chapter 7, verse 5, where Jesus admonishes us to first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We usually don't do that in conflict, right? In the middle of a conflict, when something happens, we usually begin, either we, 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 we go back, uh, we, we, we avoid conflict, right, and hide, or we are on the attack, and we don't see the, the log in our own mouth. We don't even look for it, to be honest with you, all right? And, and Jesus actually says, no, the first thing that I want you to do, I want you to glorify me, but then I want you to actually step out of the situation and ask yourself, what have I done wrong? <clears throat> What did I do? Am I part of the problem? Did I do something here? Did I create this environment? Did I create this situation? There's two kinds of logs that you need to look at when you're seeing uh, your part of conflict, all right? First, you need to consider your own attitudes and the attitudes and, and bias opinion that you might have. That's what Jesus is talking about. Because when we're in conflict, we have our own attitudes and we have, we have an opinion about who's wrong and who's right. Already, And Jesus is like, no, 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 I want you to step back, and I want you to look at your attitude, and I want you to look at uh, your biased opinion, critical, negative, maybe overly sensitive attitudes. <laughs> Anybody here with that? You ever hear when people talk about you wear your feelings on your sleeve, that might be you? Hey, I love you, all right? All right? But that can create a problem in conflict, all right? Unnecessary conflict. One of the best ways to do this is to spend some time meditating on Philippians chapter 4, right? You guys know what that is? Philippians chapter 4, verses 2 through 9. It's talking about the attitude of Jesus, right? And man, when you take that verse, when you take that scripture, and you're in the middle of conflict, all of a sudden, Ron Wood did something to me. I'm mad, all right? All right, Lord, I've had it up here with Ron. I'm tired of you talking to me about OU football all the time. How am I going to deal with it? 
all right? And, and this could be a conflict between right, because, right yeah, because, because KU and OU play, we play this week, uh, so we might have conflict, I don't know. But if I go, okay, how am I going to, go, am I going to glorify God? And all of a sudden I pull out Philippians chapter 4 and I'm starting to read this. All of this. It's two, four, three, nine, I think. Oh, did I, did I write it down wrong? Four, three. Ah. Four, three, two. Okay. Here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 It's great. It's just a conflict. Yeah. And I'm just rocking all this. Yeah. Well, we wanted to share with you. Yeah. Yeah. Christ's humility. That's what we're talking about. So yeah, I said Philippians four. No, so it's Philippians chapter two. Four. Yeah. Chapter two, starting with verse two through nine. All right. So yeah, if you meditate on that, man, everything begins to change. All right, because it describes the kind of attitude that we, as Jesus followers, should really have. Uh, not just in conflict, but in life, all right? In resolving conflict. The second law you must deal with is actual simple words or actions that you might have done, all right? Believe me, all right? I know that we're all perfect in this room, all right? But there are times, there are times in conflict where we've actually done something, and it's really hard for us to see it, you know? Like for me and my wife sometimes, it's really hard. Like I will say something, she goes, and she'll get mad. And I go, why did you get mad? She goes, well, it's the way you said it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I didn't even hear it that way, <laughs> right? And so then I, then I have to use a, a referee, which is one of my daughters. Goes, did I say it like that? Yeah, you did. Oh, okay. Now I have to come back to that, right? So, you know, sometimes we have to actually, the log that we're looking at might be ourselves because we actually have done things that, that cause pain and hurt. Uh, because we're actually blinded to our own failures. We need honest friends, all right? Or maybe judges like, or referees like kids to come alongside and help us, right? To look at us, who will help us to look at the problem, the conflict objectively, and to look at ourselves and face up to our own conflict and that we caused, right? And let me just say this. If you are a believer in Jesus, I believe what Jesus did on the cross, the power of the cross, the blood spilled, the resurrection of his life, all right, and the Holy Spirit, as he ascended, the Holy Spirit descended, and I believe the power of the Holy Spirit. And I have a big time problem with Christians who go, well, that's just who I am. No, it's not. That might have been how you used to be. That might have been the way that you resolved conflict before Jesus came into your life. But the Holy Spirit's living in you. You're transformed. And so when you start growing that around, and I've heard that a lot in three years of pastor work, man. Well, that's just who I am. I'm like, gosh, you just shortchanged God. All right? So you got to step back and you got to look at what have I created? What have I been a part of? The most important aspect of getting the log out of your own eye is to go beyond the confession of your wrong behavior and face up to the root cause of your behavior. Right? What caused this? The Bible teaches that conflict comes from within, the desires at war within you. We looked at this verse last week. James talks about this. All right? James chapter 4. I should have put Philippians two up there, right? That way I wouldn't have, yeah, if I would have had it wrong, we wouldn't have had this little conflict. <laughs> so he talks about this, right? This is our attitudes, right? We, we have this desire to win the quarrels and the fights that, ha- that happen among you. And then in Matthew chapter 15, verse 18, uh, listen to what Jesus says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These things come from within, right? And Jesus is talking to this about his disciples because they don't understand the parable that he used there. Some of the desires are obviously sinful, such as wanting to conceal the truth, bend others to your will, or have revenge. Those are wrong. That's not how God wants us to, to resolve our conflict. In many situations, however, conflict is fueled by good desires that you have elevated to a sinful place. 
such as an unhealthy craving to be understood, uh, an, uh, this unhealthy craving to be loved or respected or vindicated. And so that's a danger of that. And that's why you need friends. You, you need people that will come alongside of you and tell you the truth, whether or not you really are damaging you. All right, if you're hurting this situation. And I think a lot of us <clears throat> will take those kind of friends and we'll hold them at a distance because we really don't want them to come alongside of us and teach us how to be better as Christ followers. And if you have people in your life that do that, hang on to them. They are worth more than gold. All right? They will help you so further to help you further in your walk with Jesus Christ. But if you're here this morning and you're looking at your life and you don't have that kind of accountability with people, right, that will come alongside of you when you're like, like, I, I, my youngest daughter, she, she's so great to come along and go, and Dad, you're being stupid. <laughs> All right? And I told her, I told Kyla this, I said, don't ever lose that. All right? And especially when somebody comes alongside you and says, Kyla, you're being stupid, listen to them, all right? Because it may, makes you step back and go, am I hurting? All right? And if you don't have people that do that in your lives, maybe this is a chance for you to open up the curtain, all right, to go, why do I not have people that want to come alongside of me and tell me when I'm not, when I'm not acting like Jesus? What are some of the causes, what, what are some of the most common root causes that, de- that you deal with that causes many of your conflicts? Anybody want to venture out there? we have anybody that wants to share? No? It's like, oh yeah, we're not diving into that. I'm a right fighter. I'm a right fighter. You're right? You've got to be right? So how, you, how I mean, looking at this now, how? I'm going to say I'm going to That's all right. <laughs> a lot of conflicts come from past traumas. Yeah. Yeah. That you're guarding against. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, we see that in foster care, don't we? With, with kids. Like, I mean, we had, you know, the three year old that we had, JoJo, he had a lot of trauma and he had a lot of anger. And some of you got to see that anger in the nursery. Uh, all right. And uh, man, we, we were trying to figure out how, how do we deal with this conflict? and teach a three-year-old, but it was beyond my pay grade. <laughs> like, God, you did not create me to deal with this you. All right? And so, what else? Anything else? My ego and a pride yeah. that wants to be understood, that wants to be, um, decides what feels like a put down, and then it's defensive. Right. It does. We get defensive, don't we? Mm-hmm. Even when somebody that a Christian brother or sister comes along inside of love, and that's a, that's a whole thing. Hey, you guys get a double whammy today, and this was done intentionally. I just let you guys know uh, that we're dealing with conflict today, and the law got of your own eye. And so you're going to go upstairs, and we're going to talk about how God we've been cultivating, right? Cultivating God's correctness, how God corrects us. All right. So yeah, welcome today. Right. <laughs> But you're looking at it and you get defensive when somebody comes alongside in brotherly love and you get defensive. All of a sudden that can cause conflict, right? Because God's going to use people. Because God doesn't speak to us like he did to, us, to, the, to the Old Testament people like Jonah. We're going to talk about Jonah. God has this conversation with Jonah. I'd love for God to. It had been great when I was fostering and God would have just came in and said, let me sit down and talk to you about how stupid you're being, right? Like he did with Jonah uh, when the plan died. But God usually doesn't do that. Instead, he will send people, and, and they might not say it in the right tone or the right way. They might not be good with their words, but they're coming along trying to teach you. I had lunch this week with somebody. Now you're all going to be trying to figure out who I had lunch with, right? Uh, and they said some things, and at first I got really defensive at the table, and then I started to go, what is God trying to teach me right here, right now? And that's really hard because, like you said, pride gets in the way. Anytime you become excessively preoccupied with something, even a good thing, and seek to find happiness or security or fulfillment in it rather than God, you are guilty of idolatry. Idolatry leads us to conflict with God. And this is what James is talking about. This is what the conflict back in James chapter 4 causes with people. James writes about this. All right? 
Having done the hard work of discovering your part in the conflict, it's time to take action. So here we go. We got to roll through these. All right. We actually have a seven-step process to help you find uh, to examine yourself and then move forward as a peacemaker. Because that's what we really want to do in this class. By the end of these four weeks. We want to be peacemakers. And so here's the first thing that you need to do. Ask the Lord and others for help with self-awareness. All right? One of the keys in adaptive leadership, and especially in the, in the society that we live in today, the culture that we live in, the church is always changing. The gospel never changes, but the method of how the gospel is presented changes. And so you have to be an adaptive leader. And one of the keys to being an adaptive leader is being self-aware or self-reflecting. All right? And this is where a lot of leaders lose sight of self. Of self-reflecting, self-awareness. First John chapter 1, verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin and we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. All right? Yeah. So there's the first one. Ask the Lord for others. And this thing's got a mind of its own. It's acting like I am. Okay. All right? So there's 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. Ask God to show you uh, where you have been guilty of wrong worship, which is to say, where have you been focusing your attention, your love on something other than God and His <laughs> desires. All right? Psalms 139. This is a great psalm. Um, the whole song is great in itself. Verses 23 and 24. It says, search me. Oh God, and know my heart. Have you ever prayed that? Have you ever laid down and prayed about that before a conflict or in the middle of a conflict? Search me, oh God. Identify and renounce the desires contributing to the conflict. Deliberately pursue right worship. Fix your heart and mind on God and seek joy in only Him. Not winning the conflict, but seek joy in God and God alone. All right? Give others to speak into your life. And regularly ask them to help you. Help you. Here's the big thing. Listen to this. Find people and ask them regularly, help me find the logs in my eye. Right? How many of you have ever asked that to somebody? Yeah. yeah. No. I don't want to see those. I, I'll be honest with you. I know a lot of them. All right? And it's really painful sometimes when you go and you sit down with some people and they start pointing out some things that you're like, ah. And it's, it's easy to be defensive. But then when you reflect and you're self-aware and you're looking back on it, you go, maybe I am like that. And you start to make these little changes. All right, here's the second thing that we need to do. All right, address everyone involved as soon as possible. Address everyone involved as soon as possible. Do you hear that? You know what, I'm going to kick it under the rug for a while. Actually, I'm going to go to this little circle of friends and talk to them about this. Or I'm going to, I'm going to go, you know, I want to wait, wait. This is, this, is, this is one. If our elders were down here, not Keith, because he's new, all right? <laughs> if our elders were down here, I would, this is one of our biggest problems. We have, we have as leadership, you know, because none of us want to deal with conflict. We're like, eh, let's wait. Let's see what happens. And you all know what happens if you don't deal with conflict. It's going to fester, and it's going to blow up, and it's going to be ugly. And this is one of the things that we as Christians, we have got to change. All right, so I'm going to just give you some verses here, all right, that you can write down and you can read later. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Um, Jesus talks about this, about reconciling with your brother. Proverbs 6, uh, verses 1 through 5. Again, it's about reconciling with your brother, okay, with your sister. Making sure that you go and correct this, you handle it, you don't wait. All right, here's another thing. Here's the third thing. Maybe. There you go. My gosh. Oh, those are the verses. Here we go. Avoid if, but, maybe. Don't make excuses. All right? Avoid those. All right? When possible, with both attitudes and actions. All right? So you just avoid this. Luke chapter 15, it's the parable of the lost son, of the, the, uh, the parable of the, of the son and him coming back home, the prodigal son. All right? So that's, that's a great example of that, right? Number four, 
we're getting short on time. It's already. Apologize. You gotta apologize. And let me tell you, we live in a society today that, I mean, a heartfelt apology was worth a thousand words. We have this, this, this culture today that is like, hey, be good. That's not apologizing. <laughs> All right. Hey, we, 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 we okay. We're bros, we're good. Yeah. Right? And that's not that's not going, hey, I apologize for my part. <laughs> Being going to somebody and going, hey, are we good? That's just been like, hey, we kind of dealt with it. We really didn't. We, we dealt with a little, but not really resolved it. Uh, we, we just good. Let's just go on. And you're just, you're, you're cheapening it. And God says, no, I want you to apologize for your, hey, we can go back. I know a lot of you were here in 2006 when we had conflict in the church. There was nobody in this room that looked a lot different than this room did today. All right? Nobody wanted to apologize for any of their actions. And it was, it was, it was devastating. It was ugly. Yeah, and it set the church back. Right? I, I feel like that was 2006, and here it is, almost 2024, yeah. and we finally are through that. Like, even as far back as five years ago, I can still see little signs of that. And that's what conflict does when you don't resolve it, right? And when you don't apologize. There is nothing weak about apologizing. And I think we get it in our mind that, oh, if I apologize, I'm weak. I'm a loser. Yeah, we do. It's our pride again. We go back to that. Number five is ask for forgiveness. All right? Proverbs 28, 13 says this, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. I don't know about you. We could talk a lot about forgiveness. There's a lot in the Bible about forgiveness. All right? Here's number six. Accept the consequences. Right? Accept the consequences. Luke chapter 19, verse 9. He talks about Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Right? And I love what Zacchaeus does in this story. He actually accepts the consequences. And he pays back even more than what he stole from people. I remember when I was a youth minister in Kansas and there and <laughs> I had come up with this great idea that we would play paintballs in the cemetery. I've told this story before. You might, some of you are new. But I was a youth minister. We played one night in the cemetery with paintball guns. It was a blast. I mean, there's great places to hide, right, behind tombstones and stuff. But, man, I thought it was supposed to rain, like, the next day, and so it was paint would wash off the tombstones, but it didn't rain, all right? And by, like, four days after it, Rumors were going around town that people had vandalized the cemetery. And I was like, really? And I drove out there and I was like, oh, that's us. <laughs> right? And I mean, people were really, you did every right. I mean, I was young, I was stupid, I'll be it. Because, I mean, your loved one's buried there and somebody just desecrated their tombstone with paint. And I had to go before the elders. And I remember telling Carrie's not in here, but I was like, we could get fired her. We, I can get fired. <laughs> right? She was like, well, you got to go confess and accept the consequences. And I did. And they didn't fire me. They, they made me get buckets of water and walk around the cemetery for like two days, scrubbing everybody's grave. And I was like, never again will I do that. And here's the last one. Maybe. <laughs> Alter your behavior, commit to changing harmful habits. All right? That goes back to what we said earlier, you know, where people are like, well, that's just who I am. No. No, not if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. If you believe in the power of the cross and the resurrection of an empty grave, that's not who you are in the next Right? And so we pray that that's what you take and you learn to, to, to look at how to glorify God and to look at the law in your own eye before you leave the speck in your brother's eye when you start, when you're in the middle of a problem, all right? So 
It is 1024. Love you guys. See you upstairs, right? Because now it's part two of how to deal with God's prayer.